So I'm going to run through this stuff pretty quickly, um, but just uh, the original part of this presentation was sort of intended for an undergraduate audience to get them excited about uh, some publishing opportunities that are available. And the Boston AES chapter is sort of uniquely situated because we're really in a hotbed for um, audio technology development right around here. So uh, this is something we'd like to encourage as a chapter of getting more people publishing through AES, but also through other channels and making, uh, doing everything we can to encourage that scholarship and connect people uh, to scholarship opportunities. So when you think about just the people who are in this room, um, there are a lot of great people to bounce your ideas off of, test your methodology uh, with uh, just over around at the bar. Uh, that's not something that somebody who's maybe in Cleveland, Ohio has the same access to. Uh, so we're very fortunate to have that here. And the hope is that we might be able to uh, encourage that and find ways to encourage it. I'm going to sort of go through the whole spiel, even though uh, I don't think we have a majority undergraduate audience, uh, but just in case people are going to be watching this later uh, for that purpose. But I, I would invite all the professionals in the room who have probably been through this process more times than I have to share your experience as well so uh, we can get that documented for everybody. Um, so when we think about different sources that are out there, uh, this is kind of, you know, that graduate research seminar thing. Uh, there are popular sources like magazines. These are probably commercial publications that have some articles, some interviews, that kind of thing. Um, they're really intended for a broad range of reading audiences. Uh, and they're presented in sort of an informal tone. So this might be what you're reading in tape op. This might be sound on sound, resolution, something like that. I would maybe put the audience at people like Owen and I, who are more on the music production side of things, but we can read this and maybe get the idea of a technical topic, but there could also be an interview with a producer, an engineer, a musician in that same publication. Then there are scholarly sources, which we might think of as academic journals. Um, and this is really expert level research where it's probably going to be engineers talking to each other and presenting things. And this is really going to be based in the scientific method originally and making sure that any resources that you're citing are very cred credible and they're properly cited. Um, focus here is creating things that are hopefully repeatable so that a peer reviewing audience who is probably going to be assessing this paper before it gets published by a journal can repeat your steps or can look at your methodology and say, yeah, this person thought through this and I think this has scientific val validity. So some examples of this would be the Journal of the Audio Engineering Society, IEEE has a number of different journals. Acoustical Society of America has journals. Uh, these academic journals that are often peer reviewed. There are other sources like trade publications and then uh, blogs and other online content. Uh, Commercial Integrator is a trade publication that sort of crosses over with some of the business we do. And then you can think about blogs like uh, Front End Audio, Pro Tools Expert, where they're trying to do some very rigorous uh, sort of writing, but it's still probably targeted at guys like Owen and myself. Um, so academic research within the AES uh, is really captured. There is the journal, which is published regularly. There are conferences, which are sort of on very specific topics. And then there are the conventions. So who has been to an AES convention? All right, great. So these are large events in New York, LA, cities in Europe. Um, there is usually the trade show floor, but there's also a whole sort of conference section going on at the same time with different tracks who are talking about scholarly research that's going on. Uh, the conference is sort of no trade show floor. It's just talking about a particular topic. So conferences are going to be really specialized. So it might be uh, folks who are talking about the automotive industry. Uh, some of the conferences that are coming up are on audio restoration and repair. Um, and this is a screenshot of the Boston AES website. We've actually collected all the AES conferences, conventions, and calls for papers into one place here. Because if you go to AES.org, you can't find them all in one place. If you go to BostonAES.org, they're all in one place. And we've also put the deadlines there and links to those. So uh, 
if you're looking for opportunities to do some research or publish some research, you can go here and kind of find that. We're also going to add in some of the other institutions. Uh, so we might add in IEEE deadlines, uh, ASA deadlines, other things that might kind of cross over uh, to our in interests within our membership just to make sure people are aware of all the opportunities that are out there. And one thing that I think is worth mentioning uh, when we think about other organizations, um, you can start at something like IEEE, which is you know, really difficult to get a publication into IEEE. You can work your way down into some very small sort of niche kind of programs. But if you're trying to maybe get your first publication, something like the Society for the Art of Record Production is a small organization that's trying to get its legs. That's a great place to maybe get your first peer-reviewed paper, something like that. Um, there are also great mentors who are available in these things who, there are members of SARP who are regularly published in ASA and AES. Uh, so you can sort of pick their brains because they'll be peer reviewing your paper at this level and that can help you sort of rise up through the process. Um, so when we're talking about AES papers, uh, you all often see in the call for papers three different categories. So category one, uh, you are submitting a complete manuscript for peer review. So that means the paper is ready to go, you send it off first thing, they send it out for peer review if it's accepted. Category two is you submit an abstract or a presis. So an abstract would be maybe 300 words, a presis would be 500 to 750 words describing your methodology, uh, sort of the, your proposal for the project. That gets peer reviewed, but your paper doesn't get peer reviewed. It's just that section. And then there's category three, which is where I spend my time, which is engineering briefs, which no one gives a hoot about. They actually do give a hoot about it. They, it goes through an approval process, but your actual paper and, uh, is never peer reviewed. So that, that wouldn't necessarily fit into that highest category of scholarly research. Um, but it's still a great way to start writing papers in this template start presenting your research ideas and getting some feedback on it early. So let's look at a few different uh, types. This would be a category one paper that was presented by two academics. Uh, it was all peer reviewed. You can sort of get a sense of the format. There is a short abstract. We'll talk quickly about what goes into an abstract, an introduction. We're missing a page where they do sort of a review of relevant literature, some analysis, they arrive at some conclusions. But this entire thing was peer reviewed and presented at a convention. Uh, this is a category three engineering brief. So there is even a disclaimer that says, uh, this was selected on the basis of a submitted synopsis. The author is solely responsible for its presentation. None of this is peer reviewed. Still the same format where there's a short abstract, introduction, methodology, some analysis and maybe a brief conclusion. So the formatting is all the same, but it doesn't go through that whole peer review process. Uh, this is kind of a legendary paper in our field. This is Massenberg's parametric equalization paper. Uh, you can see that even in 1972, the basic framework is kind of the same. An abstract, he sort of walks through things. There are some diagrams, there might be formulas, but he's trying to present enough information that he can describe uh, the process he's going through. This is sort of another take on that format where this is published in the journal of the AES, but it's sort of uh, trying to bridge that gap between the sort of popular audience, which I'll keep referring to as Owen and myself, uh, but with the rigors of a peer reviewed paper. So this is one of Alex Case's papers, which was conducted and peer reviewed, but then its method of presentation was sort of in more of an article format that somebody who's comfortable reading tape op could then be comfortable reading this article in the journal and getting some information out of it. So thinking again about an undergraduate audience getting started with their own research, um, finding topics, uh, lots of these conferences will actually have suggested topics where they say this is what we want to focus on. Uh, so that may come out in not enough time to actually come up with research for that particular conference. But it can cite things that the organizers of that conference have said, we need more scholarly research in these fields. So they'll have a dozen to 15 different uh, topics that 
people are thirsty for information on. Expanding existing research like taking the work that Brewster has already done and taking his suggestions and saying, I actually want to grab onto that thread or this vein of something that he started and take it a step further. Um, the, the other thing is I, uh, I find that every paper I read and maybe every presentation we have here, I come away with more questions than answers. And I think that's actually the sign of really great research is it's continuing the process of asking more questions. If somebody comes to the end of a research process and says, I have all the answers, then they did something wrong. So uh, assessing what questions you have after reading a paper could give you the next topic to dig in on. There are personal curiosity things of just, uh, is this resistor company full of snot? Uh, there's looking at myths of, uh, is this IEC cable actually quieter? I would love to read a paper about that. Testing different components like these resistors, like IEC cables, and then thinking about innovative new ideas. So Massenberg's parametric EQ paper was an innovative new idea. You might have a new idea that you want to test and then present the results of, perhaps for someone to pick up on and continually expand. Developing an abstract is something that you'll probably rework at the end of your process, but Let's just say you have an idea and you want to pitch it to Brewster or to Monty or to Owen just to get their feedback on it. They basically want to hear an abstract. So what's in an abstract? It's probably about 100 to 300 words and a concise description of what the topic is, why this topic is valuable to study, and how that research is going to be conducted. So just quickly kind of your elevator pitch of what this research is going to be about. Uh, they might say, you know, this is really great. I want to read that paper. And at that point, it might be time to start digging into the AES e-library, which is free for every AES member, uh, to go in there and say, what other research has already happened with this? So um, checking not only there, but also looking for other relevant publications. And that might be a, a good time to actually uh, ask around within this group, because there may be people who are regularly reading the IEEE journal or regularly reading the ASA journal and say, actually, there's this person who's done a bunch of related research. You should go read all their stuff. Um, and I, I would say that it's not simple enough as just putting your search term into the AES e-library e and you will instantly get every piece of relevant literature back that you just throw into your bi bibliography and you're done. It really means reading those papers and then digging into their bibliography and seeing what papers they read and then digging into those bibliographies. So you may well read 50 to 100 papers before you even start your own research to say what mistakes did they make, what process did they employ to arrive at the conclusions that they found, where do I want to poke holes in that, where do I want to learn from their mistakes, where do I think they might have gotten things wrong, and how do I summarize that into a concise little thing that somebody reading my paper can realize, hey, this person studied all the research that's been done before, and I don't have to go read all those papers because they gave me a quick sort of overview of what research has already been done. So uh, from here, if you're really doing sort of an experiment, uh, like the one that Brewster just walked us through, um, you have to develop a methodology and document that um, in a way that uh, can be repeated by someone else. If they were to pick up your paper and say, I don't buy it, or I buy it, could they then repeat that same experiment with the same equipment and get the same results? That's what we're hoping for. Um, so looking at what people have done in the past and seeing how you might improve upon it uh, is a great way to get started there. There are also uh, some standard methods recommended by organizations like ITU, even the AES standards, recommend some things for, let's say, subjective listening. They recommend certain types of tests that have been documented uh, by those organizations and tested extensively. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel when you're trying to come up with a subjective listening experimentation, something like that. Um, and then just asking around, just the professionals around here, we have represented analog devices, Bose, uh, I think some listen folks are here. Uh, checking in with them to say, how would you guys test this in your organization? I would love to pick Eric's brain about what his notebook looks like, about what he's documenting uh, every day, 
just so if I ever wanted to test a component to the same rigors that analog devices does, I would, I would have their methodology to start from. Minimizing variables is probably the biggest challenge in here, where uh, we heard about all the challenges that Brewster ran into. It's impossible to eliminate all those variables, but calling them out and saying, this is a variable that I acknowledge, and these are variables that I'm setting aside because they're insignificant enough that I can still conduct my test, uh, but this is the variable I'm really focused on, and this is what we're testing in this experiment is important. And conducting your test multiple times and documenting each time and carefully checking your results and even modeling your results in something like SPICE or something like that to say, to sort of identify an opportunity where you might have gone horribly wrong uh, or something like that, even having a colleague come replicate those results uh, or replicate their results on their rig to make sure you aren't way off in your own methodology. Um, and again, this is a place where hopefully as you're going through this process, you're coming out with more questions, not just answers. So uh, you may arrive at an answer of uh, these different resistor values uh, or these different resistor manufacturers presented noise specifications or like this, but Brewster came out of that with a stack of new questions that offer new research opportunities, but also sort of encourage us to think more deeply about it's not necessarily just the noise, and there isn't necessarily just one way to test this. There are a lot of variables in there that could have an impact uh, on this result. So documenting your work, for me, I haven't worked in a laboratory environment uh, extensively. That's not part of what I do. There are probably a lot of you can, who can share uh, your rigorous laboratory methodologies and help us all. Um, but in sort of the most basic framework, we can think about keeping a lab notebook, uh, which would be the factual details of your methodology, of the experiments, of the ideas, making sure all those facts are documented along the way, um, and including all the instructions so that somebody could pick up your notebook, walk over, and recreate that same test. Uh, keeping logbooks of all the measurements made and the results from those things. So you're probably documenting things like FFT size and uh, if you turned off auto ranging on the, while you were doing that particular test on the AP, something like that. Um, but also making sure that you're documenting uh, date and time and other variables that might matter like temperature, um, voltage in the case of the batteries, something like that making sure that all of that is kept somewhere in a very structured method. So if you need to go back and say, I'm seeing very strange results from this, oh, maybe that had to do with the batteries draining or the temperature being different or something like that. Um, and then sort of on the non-factual side, maintaining some sort of a journal where you can sort of get your own opinions down. So it's not coloring the factual data, but you're just saying, you know what? I think this resistor manufacturer is actually on to something, or uh, I think they might be full of crap, something like that. Just making sure you're documenting that somewhere else, and even documenting, hey, I never ever want to test resistors ever again. Because uh, you might forget that, and then you have to go back and find that out. Um, so you've gone through your experimenting process. It comes time to actually put this together. Uh, if you submit for a conference or something like that, they'll actually provide you with a template that would be a Word doc uh, that's gonna look like some of those papers that we saw previously. Um, the format is probably gonna fall into something roughly like this. So that abstract that we talked about, introducing your to topic, um, a review of the relevant literature, sort of a description of your methodology, talking about the materials you used, then getting into the analysis, the experimentation, the discussion around what you did, coming to some conclusions. Those conclusions may well be uh, there are more questions we have to answer, and then making sure you are citing all these references. So everything you referenced in the lit review, everything that helped you develop that methodology is really important. So uh, if we look again at one of these, you'll notice this formatting is not necessarily what you would submit a paper in 
in a regular college class. Uh, but this is traditionally what the AES uses as a template with sort of the two columns and the abstract. Uh, for AES papers, you actually get extra credit if there are formulas and graphs and stuff like that. Um, so that kind of stuff is the academic rigor that's expected for something like that. Um, now, how can Boston AES help you get involved with some of this publishing activity? Uh, it's networking opportunities like tonight where you can meet someone who maybe has expertise in a field that you don't have as much expertise in, or they could be a peer in your field who could be peer reviewing your paper, and you have an opportunity to bounce some ideas off them, uh, have a rigorous dialogue about uh, different ways of testing things, what needs to be tested, what needs uh, to be written about, and even finding partners to help you with the research. Um, learning about opportunities that may exist in the research community uh, where um, there's this whole sort of blue ocean of resistor testing uh, that you might not have known about before getting here tonight. You learned about that here with Boston AES. Um, finding research resources. So who has $45,000 in their pocket right now? I don't, but I know there are multiple people in this room who can help me get a hold of an AP if I need it. Uh, and that's really valuable because most of us don't get great funding for the research we're doing. Uh, the academic institution I work at doesn't have an AP, but the academic institution that I used to work at does. So I call in a favor or two and I can go make a couple measurements if I have to. Um, having resources like this is really unique to the Boston area. Having Dan Foley, who's probably one of the best resources you're going to get for how the heck to use this thing, uh, being able to see him at most AES meetings is such a great resource available to us. Uh, I think fondly of the day that I hear about a student who pairs with a mentor over at Sonos and ends up getting to use their anechoic chambers for some student project, something like that. I don't know if that's ever going to happen, but that's what I imagine Boston AES could do for this community. Um, so connect, making those connections with mentors so that students who are interested in what uh, sorts of research is being done at Bose, is being done at Sonos, is being done at analog devices, uh, can really connect with those people directly. So I would love if some people who have published uh, could share some of their experiences or also um, people who are maybe new to publishing could ask questions of many of the experts who are here in the room. Or not, we could all go home. <laughs> so bostonaes.org does have a list of all the upcoming AES conferences and conventions that have made calls for papers. I did bring a poster if you're interested in what poster sessions look like. It's basically you write a paper and then you show up to the convention, you put up a poster and you talk about it. Um, that's about it. Thank you. So much. Thank you.